All right, today I'm going to talk to you about habitat and island biogeography. And uh, this is something I really like talking about because it's really cool, the ideas behind this and how pervasive they are in nature. And that's just really cool to me when things are, are uh, so robust that they occur basically everywhere we look in nature. So I think this is one of those things uh, that do that. And hopefully you'll understand what I'm talking about uh <clears throat> when i show you lots of examples and also how it's relevant to some of the next few lectures uh, that we're going to cover in this uh this class so <clears throat> i'm i'm sure some of you have probably heard of island biogeography before but it's basically uh this theory and it remember we it, it started out as an island biogeography hypothesis and has now moved to theory because it's gotten so much support from so many different studies and experiments. But the uh, idea is basically that the size and distance of an island from mainland should dictate what or which species accumulate in that island. So the size of the island and also how far it is from a source of populations should dictate how many species arrive at an equilibrium or in other words how many species are going to occur on that island we should be able to predict that based on those two factors so the theory was originally proposed by eo wilson and robert macarthur and uh it was based on uh, a couple of things that occur in nature one is the species area relationship and basically what that so the species area relationship uh, says is that as you increase the area of the observation or the amount of habitat that you have or whatever, you should increase in some predictable manner the number of species that are present. And this is probably the closest thing to a law that we have in ecology. Numerous ecologists have said something along those lines. The species area relationship is just everywhere you look in nature. And that is a fundamental part of island biogeography. And hopefully after after this uh, lecture, you'll understand why it's a fundamental part about how we manage uh, wildlife populations, particularly nowadays when we've affected the distribution of habitat pretty dramatically on the terrestrial landscape. So some basic things related to uh, island biogeography or some basic predictions of that is if we have a mainland, A, because it's closer to the mainland should have more species than B if they're the same size. Okay, so A and B here are the same size island, but they're different distances from the mainland. We should, because of increased migration, or in other words, uh, immigration of populations to the islands, should cause A to have a higher equilibrium of species or a higher biodiversity as a result of that given all other things equal. So that's a basic prediction. Another basic prediction is if the islands are the same distance from the mainland, the bigger island should have more species than the smaller island if all other things are equal because when you have a small island, the species on the islands have a higher risk of going extinct. Okay, we're not talking about going extinct from the planet. We're just talking about going extinct from that island patch. Okay, so this island right here has a bird species on it and that goes extinct. The bird species may still occur on the mainland uh, over there, but uh, it doesn't occur on that island anymore. All right, so those are two basic processes that are playing out in island biogeography. There was this really awesome experiment that they did back in the day, and this was actually in the Florida Keys where they took these little mangrove islands and they went in and put up these things around it and basically killed all of the species associated with the islands. And they did this at different distances from the mainland and also uh, with different size islands and then monitored the colonization by species of those islands again and looked at that over time. And that's how they really robustly tested the uh this hypothesis and uh basically they had this theory of equilibrium 
that is the essential part of island bow geography, which we were just talking about, where we have immigration and immigration happening, and there's some equilibrium that we should be able to predict based on those processes of distance to the island from the mainland and the size of that island. So uh, uh, there are some examples I may give you in, in here that say colonization and extinction, that's synonymous with the immigration, emigration. We have colonies, colonization and extinction or that same process. So uh, when they were talking about that balance of species richness in the theory of island biogeography, they really are talking about a balance between the colonization process, so how quickly are things uh, arriving to the island or colonizing the island or immigrating to the island, and uh, how fast are things going extinct when they're on the island. <clears throat> so uh, you remember I talked about the bigger island if they're the same distance because they, ha they should have a relatively similar uh, immigration to the island, but the extinction process has slowed down as you increase area. And here's some of the really great data from Wright uh, that was published in the early 80s showing exactly that. As you increase the area of the island, he called it turnover rate in this paper, but uh, these papers but as you increase the area, basically the probability of a species going extinct decreases. So you end up with a higher equilibrium of species on that island as a result of that. So uh, if we look at that based from a theoretical standpoint, this is some of the stuff from the theory of island bow geography in that book. If we have, if we keep immigration the same, or in other words, we have the same distance to mainland of each island, we should predict there will be a lower species equilibrium or lower number of species will be on the small island than will be on the large island right here, right? So I'm just showing you a theoretical rep representation of what we've been talking about. So if we turn that uh, the other way around say okay the islands both have a similar extinction probability or in other words they're similar size islands the near island should have more species than the far island on this if they're the same size and uh, that's based on the fact that it's easier to colonize a a nearby island than a far island so here's uh, some really great data showing this with bird species colonizing islands. And you can see the far islands uh, are the red here. The near islands are green. One thing I want you to, uh, I want to press upon you right here is to understand uh, what these relationships are actually telling us. So notice if you drew a line through the middle trying to you know get the best average of those points we would have this relatively steep curve here right so that'd be a really steep line if you grow, draw that same line through the mean of these green ones notice it's a much shallower line now think about why that might be okay so uh what's happening here is as the area increases it's having a much bigger, uh, it's having a much, the, the size of the island is having a much bigger effect on the number of bird species that can reach it, right? So think about that. We've got a far island, it's a long ways from the mainland. The effective area of the island on the accumulation of species is much stronger. So if you have a really small island that's really far away, not many things can find it. But if you have a really big island, uh, species can still find it relatively easily. When you're really close to the mainland, right? So now we, we uh, you know, it's not that far for a bird to fly across the water. It doesn't really matter how big the island is in that case, in terms of how many species will be there, the area is not affecting it as, mu as much. And that basically what I'm telling you right here is 
there's an interaction between the distance and the area. So if we hold one constant, we can see the effect of the other, but they're both interacting to influence one another. And this is really clearly showing that, uh, that species accumulate much faster with area when it's a far island than when it's a near island. So that makes a lot of sense if you start thinking about what's going on. So if you th think about archery, for instance, it's really easy to hit this target relative to that target, right? If we increase the size of that target, it's going to make it much easier for us to hit it at that long distance. However, it's already pretty easy for us to hit the close one. So bit making this uh, target 10 times bigger is probably not going to influence how many times we hit it, right? But making this target 10 times bigger is probably going to influence how many times we hit it a lot, at least uh, if you shoot anything like I do. So another thing that is that is really interesting is that that interaction between in, uh, distance and size of the island isn't equal across species. And the, the easiest way to think about that is, you know, birds, they can fly across water of great distances and it not really be that big of a deal to them relative to how much of a big deal it is to mammals. So you could see if a mammal is gonna have to swim across, now I'm obviously excluding bats here, but uh, if a mammal is gonna have to swim across, that's a much more difficult thing for mammals to do. And you see this much sharper decline in the number of mammals that can make it to an island as you increase distance than you do with birds, right? So it makes a lot of sense. And both of those processes are, are playing out simultaneously across species. So uh, really important things to consider. When we put all of these things together, we kind of get this ultimate prediction like this, where we have near small islands, we would we can predict how many species relative to far small islands or far large islands. Notice that a far large island tends to have a few less species than a near small island uh, when you're making things equal. Uh, that's important because that's telling you the distance really is having a bigger impact on this relationship than, than uh, the size of the island, but both are affecting uh, what's going on here. So let me show you some examples of this. And this is basically showing you from really small uh, grasslands and savannas just going all the way up to the world. As you increase the area of the, the habitat type all the way up to the world scale, we have this nice relationship with how many species are in there. So species richness is just the count of the number of species, unique species in the given area. You can see uh, we've taken the log of the relationship, but we're basically looking at how big is the area. And as you increase the size of the area, the world would be right here at, you know, if we took the entire world, that'd be right here at 14. We have this nice relationship with uh, species richness and area. So just to show you that some more, if you didn't take the log of the X and Y so the X and Y axis, if we normally would take the log of those two relationships, but if you don't, you end up with this curve like this. So it looks kind of like a predator functional response, right? We'll go back and remember uh, which one it looks like. If we took take the log of those two, it turns this curved line into a straight line, which is just easier for us to interpret. But this is the relationship that we see with area. That's the true relationship. As you, you know, when you increase patch size over the, the first half of the area, right? So we've got from zero to 100,000, from zero to 50,000, as you increase area, it's having a really big effect on how many species colonize. And then when you go from 50 to 100, there's not that many species. Uh, that you pick up from doing that. So uh, that's the typical relationship that we see. If we look on these islands with just the number of species in general, uh, we see a very similar relationship where areas having a really big impact and a predictable impact on the amount of species. Notice here, if we look at the same thing with distance, the number of species with distance to the mainland, to the island, the number of species declines precipitously. 
So here's another cool example for those of you who are bird lovers. There are many, many studies about this with birds. And I think it's because they're pretty easy to study in island systems. So you have kind of a natural experiment. Uh, they can colonize relatively quickly. Uh, and that makes it an easier study system than, than uh, plants or some of the other things we typically study. But uh, basically, when they were looking in this island system, they saw exactly what we should expect is that isolated islands in as you increase area uh we saw this sharp relationship in uh these new guinea islands which were relatively close we still saw a relationship with area but remember they're really close to the mainland so uh not as steep of a slope or not in other words area isn't quite as important when you're really close as it is whenever uh, you're really far so same relationship and this is real world data showing that birds actually accumulate this way here are several other examples from birds where they've shown similar relationships uh i'm not going to go into all of these in detail i'm just trying to show you that this does occur really widely in nature Amphibian, amphibians and reptiles i know there are a bunch of you in here that love those same thing plays out with these species uh, maybe some of you are really interested in bats. I know we have uh, quite a few <clears throat> bat species that are uh, of conservation concern and a lot of people are studying them. So there's probably some opportunities for you to get experience or go to graduate school studying them. Bats conform to the same idea here in real the real world. I know some of you really like plants and uh, hopefully you like plants or at least appreciate them more after that discussion we had uh, recently with habitat selection and plants, but plants uh, show the same process playing out where the island area and distance really impacts uh, the number of plants that are there. <clears throat> Here are some other examples. Uh, this has been shown in all kinds of systems with plants, which is really cool. Uh, some of you might be interested in fish. I know there were a couple of you at least that were interested in marine sciences. Same thing happens with freshwater fishes, or if you look on the size of coral reefs, for instance, uh, same processes are working on those. Here's one I thought was really cool. Uh, people call these sky islands, and basically we have a bunch of wildlife species that are adapted to high elevation. And as you might imagine, we have high elevation on the, the peaks of mountains and in a mountain chain, you basically have these little islands where uh, the lowland in between the peaks isn't suitable and uh, separating these into islands. And here's an example with mammals showing that mammal uh, species richness changes just like we should expect based on island biogeography. Uh, also in Sky Islands, you can see birds and mammals again. Birds are much e can much more easily go between. So we tend to see a little bit higher of a species richness, but the accumulation or the, in other words, the importance of area is not quite as important for birds as it is mammals. And that's because of the distance is having a bigger effect on mammals than birds, but still predictable uh, number of species based on the area of the Sky Island. Another one, this was uh, pretty interesting to me. This was a study done in Madrid, just showing uh, the natural areas in Madrid. Uh, they're within the city. The size of those predicted pretty well how many bird species were in the area, which is pretty cool. This one really blew my mind when I found this study. And it was basically looking at vacant urban lots and how many plants were in them in cities. And I just thought it was amazing that the number of plant species that you could expect is uh, predictably related to the area of that patch, right? I just thought, man, that's wild that that occurs even in that system, you know, was so unnatural. Uh, the way we've created, but it still conforms plant, by, you know, all these, these uh, biogeographical -geo things are playing out in that system with, with actual species. I just thought that was so cool. Uh, so there are some other things that happen. Uh, one thing that we see in the turnover rate, we're basically talking about extinction uh, of species with distance. When we have islands that are really close, 
and this is one of the reasons that being close has a bigger effect. They, we have what we call this rescue effect. So that the distance uh, being really close overcomes the the risk of extinction of being on a small island for for really close islands. And it's just because you can think about it when things die off in an island, they, they're so close, they can just recolonize really quickly from the mainland. So it's basically uh, causing this rescue effect where really close islands, the immigration to that island is so fast that it's overcoming the extinction rate of being on a, on a uh, small island. So another thing that happens a lot in nature, and this one is particularly important, and you need to really understand this. I'm trying to emphasize it, okay? It means it's probably gonna show up again and again on an exam, and it's definitely important for the next lecture in particular. We have this small island effect, okay? So think about what's happening. As you increase the area of habitat or, or uh, you know, whatever, the, in, the, the inhabitable area, for a, a range of sizes, we don't tend to increase the number of species. And then we hit some critical threshold. And then all of a sudden area starts having a big impact on the number of species present. And think about what's going on here. So if I took a, a Petri dish of rainforest, right? That's kind of ridiculous to think about, but I think you'll understand what I'm talking about. If I took that petri of rainforest, there aren't that many species in the rainforest that can use that size of rainforest, right? But if I took two or three or four or 10 or 20 or even 50 petri dishes of rainforest, there still aren't very many species that can live in that small of a rainforest, right? But at some point, I would add enough rainforest where maybe I've gotten 10 or 15 acres of, of rainforest, let's just say, for instance. All of a sudden now, that, that is enough rainforest for some of the rainforest species to start colonizing it. So that's what you're seeing right here. At all of these different sizes of the patch area, it's still too small for most of the species to get to come to that uh, patch and being able, be able to live there. And then at some point we reach a size, this critical threshold, where now it's big enough that some of the species can colonize. And air, as you increase area from then on, it has a really big impact on the number of species that can live there. And uh, this has been shown in a whole bunch of different systems, but uh, certainly in a diversity of wildlife systems, you can see uh, insects, birds, mammals, and uh, reptiles and amphibians, they, they all conform to this. And this is just showing you some of those, uh, those areas, you know, how, how big does it need to be before they get colonized by, by uh, some of these species. And you can see they're different shapes based on the life history traits and, and uh, what those species need, there's a lot of difference in the shape of that curve. But the main thing is there is some critical threshold that is needed in habitat to meet the requirements of species enough that you start accumulating them as you increase area. So that's a really important thing to think about and think about fragmentation on the landscape and habitat restoration practices. What I'm telling you here is if you're not meeting, if you have some target species, let's say it's birds and you don't have, you've restored habitat, but it's not at a critical area threshold, then you won't get any birds out of it, right? We can restore a two square meter patch of prairie all we want. And we could do that, you know, in multiple areas and we're not gonna get more prairie birds out of that, right? There's a critical th threshold in area. And that, obviously I'm giving you ridiculous examples. We would never restore a one meter square of, of uh, habitat. But, you know, when we start thinking about square kilometers and it needing to be 10 square kilometers for some species of mammal, we may actually not be meeting that in a lot of cases, and it may not be that intuitive to us that we need to do it at that scale. I think you'll get a lot more appreciation out of that when uh, Brandon Muriel, our TA, talks about the uh, 
the Florida Panthers, you know, it takes an enormous amount of area to be restored before it's suitable for that species. So just keep that in mind uh, when we're going into these other lectures. And I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to listen to it. And I, I hope that uh, this is really cool to you that we have island bow geography playing out in all these different systems all over the planet. And we can operationalize that knowledge to actually actively restore populations on the landscape. And to me, that is really cool to think about. So uh, looking forward to talking to you more about this in the next lecture.